welcome to this episode of the Martial Arts Studies Podcast. What follows is the audio and video, depending on how you're receiving this, um, of a, an online presentation I gave for a conference um, in July on the subject of translating and transforming and transmitting Chinese popular culture. It was called Chinese Popular Culture in Translation and Transmission. And it was organised by Dr. Yan Wu and uh, several other academics from Chinese universities. Dr. Wu is um, a lecturer at Leicester University. Um, so it's basically just a recording and I, I think my internet connection falls out towards the end, but I think it was it was only for a little while. So yeah, no, you've got that kind of real live vibe going on. So hope you enjoy it. Speaker of the keynote session is Professor Paul Bowman. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> and good evening. We have. And good evening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, from the United States. Uh, I would like to give you a briefing introduction to Professor Paul Bowman. Paul Bowman is um, Professor of Cultural Studies and Deputy Head of the School of Journalism, Media. And culture at Cardiff University. He is the author of a dozen books, many of which examine Asian martial arts in media and culture. His most recent book is The Invention of Martial Arts Popular Culture from Asia to America. He is also a founding editor of the journal Martial Arts Studies and founder and director of the Arshal. Arshal a more martial arts studies research network. Uh, Poor, please, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, can I share my screen? Yeah. Um, can you see that? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so let me just play that. And hopefully I'm in it. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, um, Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I'll set my timer for 15 minutes so that I don't um, <laughs> so that I don't go on too long. I haven't really fully timed this yet. Um, yeah, thanks for the, the really interesting presentations um, that we've just seen as well. I think this follows on in a, in a, in a kind of a, a different form of translation because so my title is translating Tai Chi and changing Qigong in British media culture. And that title um, relates to some research um, that we did. It was a, a based on a, a collaborative uh, research grant that was um, gained by uh, a visiting researcher from China uh, at Cardiff called uh, Ma Xujie. And um, he organized a, a big project looking at the dissemination of Chinese martial arts into to Britain in the first instance. Um, and my job was going to be researching um, the media representations, British media representations of, of Tai Chi specifically in Britain. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> so, so that kind of, it paused a lot of it. Um, but what I want to do today is talk about something that I hadn't expected to happen when we arranged to do this research. And that's essentially a, a massive change in status in the British context of Qigong. Um, and that was caused by the pandemic. So if I can just click, so here's an advert. This, these are kind of adverts to, on, on that, that side. Uh, they started to appear during the pandemic in my newsfeed and it's kind of ultra orientalist um, representation of Qigong. It's thousands of years old, it's dynamic. It, it's gonna solve all of your life problems. And I wasn't expecting this, these, this type of practice to emerge so significantly in the British media, but it did. Um, so the, in terms of translation, the, this is not linguistic translation. This is more about the, the transmission and dissemination. So there's a very interesting documentary about Chen Manqing, which came out in 2016. It's called The Professor, Tai Chi's Journey West. It's not, it's not perfect film, it's not brilliant, but, but one of the things that I remember from it is that when Chen Manqing started teaching Tai Chi in America, the people who came to learn Tai Chi from him were not 
kind of, um, you know, very kind of conservative, traditional, um, maybe even upper class kind of Westerners. They were often hippies and countercultural people and people who were taking drugs and people who were anti-institutional, anti-establishment. So what happens in that process is that you have the transmission of a practice from East Asia into, into, a, into a Western context in America. And the practice is inserted into a context, a very different context, and that effectively changes its status. So, so Tai Chi in the West was always associated with something countercultural. Um, I know in, in China it's been nationalized in various ways and it's taken to represent the most kind of nationalistic um, form of quintessential Chineseness possible. But in the in the West, it's often been associated with countercultural and, 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 and anti-institutional. It's associated with nature, it's associated with, with rejecting institutions. So the, this is a really big deal because this means that Tai Chi in the West is always, was always going to be something very different from, from Tai Chi in the East. Um, different demographics, different place in society, different social structures. And the question for me has always been one of how do you theorize this change? How do you theorize the significance of this? Um, and I've worked with um, lots of different theoretical paradigms, but I guess one of the most interesting recent developments was a, a book that I read called Dream Trippers. And the subtitle is um, Global Taoism and the Predicaments of, of model, Modern Spirituality. And in uh, Dream Trippers, so the authors Palmer and Siegler, they, they look at the, the meeting, the encounters between Taoist practitioners, East and West. So you have American or European or Australian, counter, often countercultural New Age Taoists, Tai Chi practitioners, Qigong practitioners, they're interested in Buddhism and, and Taoism and Tantra and, and Hinduism and so on. And they travel to China, to all these traditional tourist destinations, these, these pilgrimage points. And <laughs> strange things happen, like the Westerners think that they know more about Taoism than, than the people in the original kind of context. And so, so they, they set out these different encounters between people, two different groups, two different traditions who are completely bemused by each other, completely like, what the hell do these people even think that they're doing? And the brilliant thing about, about this book is that it doesn't judge either. It just proves that there are different strands and different traditions of practice that kind of circulate globally and interact with each other. And you can't really say that one is false and one is true because they both exist and they both have their traditions and their investments. But there are quite a number of, um, of, of really useful concepts. They talk about the notion of like a portable tradition. So... So if you have, um, uh, say, Tai Chi or martial practice, martial culture in, in Hong Kong or in Taiwan or in, 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 where, in, in, in China or, or even in Japan or wherever, it's, it's complexly knitted into a tradition and a, and a history that gives it a kind of organic complexity that is much more automatically rich than when you encounter Tai Chi in the West and you go and you learn some portable practices. So, for instance, I, I have about um, I have a, a handful of, of practices. You know, I know some Tai Chi forms. I know the Baduan Jin stretches. I know some Qigong postures, and that's really it. That's like that would be my Tai Chi universe. And that's very different from someone who lives in a in, in a in a more richly complex kind of Tai Chi oriented oriented culture. So this notion of portable practices and things moving around and interacting in different dimensions is a, is a really um, important theoretical concept for me. I mean, I could I could talk about this the the, the theoretical stuff um, forever, really, because um, the actual the actual what I'm actually telling you about is really simple. Um, it's really straightforward. I've done a, quite a lot of of research on the, the British and Western media representations of, of Asian martial arts. Most recently, in a book that I wrote called "The Invention of Martial Arts." Um, and when I was researching for that book, I did a lot of um, looking through the, the newspaper archives and television archives to, to find out how are Asian martial arts constructed in the West. And essentially, when you get to, to Tai Chi, 
There's not much media stuff about Qigong at all. It, it, it's not really present in mainstream British media, and certainly not news media. Um, it's basically mapped onto a, a model of Orientalism in which, you know, if the West is masculine and scientific and rational and the East is mystical and feminine and so on, Tai Chi symbolizes the East. And it's like it, Tai Chi in British press is always represented as something that's quite feminine. It's for old people. Um, it's mystical. It doesn't fit into Western paradigms. Um, so it's 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 really constructed in that straightforward Orientalist way. So the research that we did uh, was me and uh, a research assistant of mine who was a former PhD student called Izati Aziz. Um, and we were funded by my Shujia's grant. And uh, we we looked specifically at, at Tai Chi. So Tai Chi and Qigong in the British context, in the, in the press, television programs, documentaries, it's alternative, it's feminized. It's because it's feminized because it's not violent. So it, it, it doesn't have any masculine characteristics in the Western discursive context. There are some instances where that's contradicted. So if you look at the, the film Lethal Weapon, for instance, um, starring Mel Gibson and, and Danny Glover, Tai Chi is called killer shit. Right, it's like it's like weird assassiny type ultra lethal stuff, but largely Tai Chi is something feminized, and it's regarded as kind of spiritual. Um, during the pandemic, now this this it, this could be predicted. It would have been hard to predict in advance, but when looking back now, you know, with the clarity of hindsight, it's it's obvious. So during the pandemic, what happens? We're all locked down. We're locked in our rooms. We're scared of contamination with other people. We've, some of us have got hardly any space at all. You can't go to the gym. You're not even allowed to go for a run. You've got an internet connection. So people become more interested in yoga, in stretching, in calisthenics, and inevitably also Qigong, because Qigong, because COVID-19 coronavirus was a, is, a, is regarded as a virus that it primarily uh, attacks the lungs, it attacks your ability to breathe, you get a cough, you get a sore throat, it, it's a respiratory issue. Qigong um, and pranayama, you know, these kind of yogic practices, these are very breath focused practices and the idea of strengthen the breath, strengthen the chi, strengthen the prana, strengthen the body. You can do this sitting down, I could do it in this chair, I don't need any more room than, than, than this, okay? So Qigong really bursts into the world online um, during the pandemic. The other thing about the pandemic that we have to remember is how stressful it was. We were, it was a state of intense anxiety. Like what's gonna happen on the other side? Am I still gonna have a job? Are, am I still gonna be able to go back to jujitsu? Are we gonna go back to the pub? Like, are we gonna be able to see our family again? Qigong and these breathing practices, um, which are very, very easy capsule practices to teach. You can teach someone Qigong much more easily than you can teach Tai Chi. In Tai Chi, you often, I mean, you can teach Tai Chi online. You, you sort of can, but it needs a lot of physical correction. If you've done a Tai Chi class, your instructor will move your arm, they'll push your shoulder down because they'll see your two tens, they'll, they'll correct your posture. Qigong, you can talk people through that. You can talk and you just have to maybe just, if it's standing Qigong, you will eventually find the, the kind of correct posture to be in. So during the pandemic, um, Qigong really becomes um, a, a new commodity something that really expands as, as a, a commodity. And inevitably you get strange hybrids. People are bored of yoga, right? Yoga has been around for ages. It's, we need a new thing. The new thing is chi. I mean, I know chi is an ancient thing, but that makes it just more sellable as a new thing. It's like, you know about prana, right? What about chi? So you get yo chi, yoga combined with qigong. You don't need as much, like to do a tai chi form in this room, I'd need to move all the furniture, but to do some yoga stretches and to do some qigong, that's easy, so yo chi. And with that, you get the new kind of aesthetic um, and you kind of aesthetic regime, kind of orientalist, vaguely countercultural, overpriced, we might want to use American terms like cultural appropriation if we want, but cultural appropriation is a, a really, really problematic concept. 
anyway, because all culture is appropriated, but in the American context, it means something quite precisely political. Um, what else do we get? How long have I talked for? Uh, oh, okay, I better hurry up. So um, you get this kind of, uh, this chi develops a, a new kind of marketable, fungible, discursive state. This, it becomes a commodity in its own right. The people who advertise it are always young, beautiful. They look like models. They look like athletes, which in itself is a transformation of the status of the notion of internal work, internal martial arts. In the West, it, it becomes an external thing. Look beautiful, like a beautiful yoga person. The first, um, the first thing that really caught my, um, let me just move some people out of the way. The first thing that really caught my attention was an advert for a, 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 um, an entity called Hey You Fit, which has a sort of vaguely Chinese sound to it. Hi you, hi you, hi you, right? And the woman who uh, is in charge of it is from Somerset in, in England. And, and she produced this uh, terrible Orientalist advert. I'll see if I can press play on this. I'm not sure what the commands will be like. Um, is that gonna play or is it? Oh, here we go. Okay, so, so this is the advert. Let me turn the sound down. Um, so this is an advert for Hey You Fit. And what we see here is a kind of discursive transfer, look at that, discursive transformation away from Qigong as being this sort of, um, this sort of, Sorry, poor uh, internet connection. You are muted, poor. I'm so sorry about that. Um, let me just find a screen to share. I want to share the screen. I wanted to show the... Um, the, the short oh, video? Oh. Yeah, it's a short video. So my everything seems to have closed, I think. So the problem is at my end. Um, and yeah. the, the conference is, okay, Lester. Okay, there's my, um, where is it? Keynote. Sorry, that's just typical, isn't it? Um, yeah, of course. So if I, I need to. Just take your time, don't worry. Yeah, so where, where's my Zoom? There's my Zoom. I'll cancel that. I'm just gonna cancel that chair. This always happens. Um, yeah. I hate, I hate my internet connection. <laughs> um, so I've got I've got maybe five minutes maximum I think according to according to my um, uh, my thingy. So I don't know how much you saw or lost of that, um, but what my interest in here is the way in which I turn the sound down, the way in which qigong is being I mean reinvented in every sense, translated into something that's much closer to yoga. They're also trying to kind of masculinize it a bit. They're trying to show these kind of quite muscular, quite athletic performers. I mean, it doesn't look like, well, some of it looks a little bit like Qigong that I've seen before. Some of it looks a little bit like yoga. Most of it is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing more or less to say about that than it's absolutely ridiculous. I became a little bit obsessed with this company, actually, How You Fit, and, and I've read all of their websites, I've read all of their material, and it's, I mean, it could take us to our conclusion. So I guess if, the, if I go conclusion here, um, <clears throat> and we look at a, a, an entity like Hey You Fit, but also lots of the other ones, White Tiger, Qigong and so on, um, we can see the way that, you know, the, the cultural conjuncture influences the identity of the practice. So uh, in a sense, Tai Chi and Qigong have been translated twice. And by translate, that means reconstructed and reconstitute, translated into the West or into a westernized, globalized economy, translated into the commodity realm of products that you can buy online courses for, right? And in, in these processes of, of translation and transmission, the origins and traditions are largely secondary. What's, what's primary is myth and connotation, and the myths and connotations around Tai Chi and Qigong uh, today are, are kind of hyper-orientalist, they're hyper, hyper orientalist now. And in them as well. So in my experience, I, I shouldn't do this, talk about a real or a true or an actual experience, but in my kind of pre-internet pre experience of Qigong, it's really quite hard, 
quite difficult discipline to practice, but in the new versions, it's all about pleasure and enjoyment to get this sense of well-being. Like, like you know, the gong, the work, the, the effort is, is, is almost not there. It's just like, do some nice stretches <laughs> and you'll feel nice, right? Um, so I think that, that the pandemic has produced or intensified um, a, a different form of translation. And, and the surprising thing is the way in which we see today a, a resurgent kind of hyper real Orientalism, uh, which is quite unexpected. Orientalism doesn't just go away, it intensifies um thanks to to media so thanks to thanks to the internet so uh, i think that's probably the long and short of it the complicated and interesting thing for me is always how you theorize these things and how you therefore make sense of them but i'll leave it at that because i think i've probably done uh 20 minutes or so i'm really sorry my connection dropped out um and thank you for your patience i will end the screen share if i can thank you thank you professor bowman Thank you for your thought-provoking talk. I have never imagined something very domestic like Qigong or Tai Chi is conceptualized, I mean, is constructed in, the, in this way or that way in the Western uh, paradigm. And in your talk, based on a study of British media archives, you have um, traced the key contours of the construction and representation of Tai Chi in British media, and especially during the pandemic lockdown. Thank you very much. We will have um, more than 10 minutes for the Q&A session. Okay, there is one, um, but this is not a question. Uh, thank you for um, one of my colleagues asked, um, may I ask how the difference between Tai Chi and Qigong is perceived in UK and how does the feminine image of Tai Chi compare with that of yoga in the Western world? Yeah, that's, thank you for that question. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> this, the, basically, um, Tai Chi is, regard, it is, it is connected with the term martial art, um, even though it's still largely feminized and people would do it for health practices because it is, you know, you can, you can have it prescribed on the National Health Service uh, as a kind of therapeutic intervention um, for people who uh, recovered from stroke or people who are suffering from, you know, aging issues and hypertension and so on. Um, so Tai Chi still, it, it, it's, it's regarded as therapeutic, but it has a reference to martial art. Qigong has no reference to martial art. Uh, even though practitioners would say, you know, do qigong and it will help you with the, your 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 combative skills and so on, people who, in my in my experience, so this is a maybe a hideous generalization from from a very very local experience, people who who are emphasizing the martial artsness of it would would prefer to talk about neigong, like internal work, rather than qigong. Um, qi is a subject of much debate in Britain in the British context you've got two lines of thought really one is there is a thing called chi it's magical mysterious uh, and it's like the force in Star Wars right <laughs> and like you know someone who's good at Tai Chi is like a Jedi Knight um, and the other the other argument is that it's about it's physiological it's biomechanical it's something that you can generate enormous amounts of force from from being very relaxed in very precise ways um, so, uh, but what I think what's interesting is that what you get today is ever more and ever faster hybrids. So Tai Chi and, and yoga and Pilates and Qigong and kind of, I don't know, pranayama breathing and uh, these things all just mush together. Um, you can do one or the other, but they're very closely related. And you see these hybrids, they kind of mingle together and become a new entity like Yo Chi. Um, yoga lattes, um, and they're still rather feminized. Uh, there, there's a study of yoga by Mark Singleton, which basically says that in the West, yoga has been positioned as this kind of healthful, non-competitive, kind of gymnastic athletic practice that uh, is, is practiced in a kind of a comfortable studio somewhere. And that makes it kind of feminine, kind of middle-class women do it. 
And I think that when you're dealing with Qigong and Tai Chi, although empirically speaking, lots of men do it, definitely, it's still positioned as quite a feminized, feminine, feminine non-competitive thing. Okay, um, Jeffrey Kinkley asks, is there any inheritance in current practices to 1980s PRC government sponsored Qigong seminars in China? Any inheritance? Uh, and if that question mean, if I'm not sure if that's a question about the kind of unbroken lineages and continuities in China, or if it's about any connection between what happens in in Britain. Um, uh, as uh, Jeffrey, are you going to ask? Do you want to? I, I was just curious. Uh, was there a lasting influence from the uh, promotion of Qigong practices uh, by the government in the 1980s? There were lots of people who went to China to seminars and so forth. Uh, I have no idea whether that was authentic Qigong practice or mostly yeah. an attempt to get foreign exchange or what. But I just wonder if there are people like that in Britain today. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, th the thing that you have to remember is that um, any if you practice Chinese martial arts, the nature of the, the construction of the, 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 the values and the, the kind of the, the kudos and the cultural capital is such that if you say you have been to China and you went to China to learn this thing, no matter if you, you, maybe, maybe, you maybe you had one lesson from a pathetic instructor, you can say I learned Tai Chi in China and you will get students on the basis of that and you will have a kind of automatic kind of kudos on the basis of that because the discourse is so orientalist. In terms of, in terms of ideas of, of authenticity, I mean, in, in China, the the forms were standardized um you know officially nationalized from the 1950s and 1960s onwards and they invented the beijing forms and that that most people uh, in china will encounter but the, the people it's one of those things where on the outside everyone just thinks oh there's tai chi right and uh, oh there's qigong but once you're on the inside you can go okay so so i, I don't want to do a, a national chain a Chinese state sponsored form of Tai Chi. So people want Chen style or they want something that went to Hong Kong and then went to Taiwan and then went to, the, and, and you know, so people, uh, the aficionados don't want to do the official Beijing stuff because they think that, well, it's nationalized and therefore not authentic. But I think that most people are aware that forms change more or less with every teacher. I think in this media age that we live now, as well as this kind of hyper real invention of new stuff that we see in the, like the, the how you fit stuff, you also have an ability to kind of verify the lineage or, or the, the characteristics of your practice. So you can now, it's much easier for me to kind of Google Tai Chi forms from like the 1900s and look at how they're doing them in like 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. Um, which actually that probably produces a lot more stability in, in forms. I think that um, the, the structure of, of Tai Chi and Qigong practice has been radically um, transformed since the 1950s over and over and over again, because uh, that's, when, that's when China really started to formalize things. Um, so I don't think that answers your question, but I think that it's, I can't really answer it in a, in a simple way, because I think that it depends we need to talk about a specific thing and go, well, is that specifically connected to something from the 80s or from the 60s or, or, or from the 19th century even? Um, most people in Britain buy into the myth and accept that what they're doing is ancient and timeless, 2,000 years old. Everything has to be 1,000 years old or 2,000 years old. And it wasn't. It was invented last week, you know? <laughs> All right, uh, Paul, can I ask you a question? Um, a little bit private. Are you a practitioner of Tai Chi or Chinese martial arts since you have written so profusely on that topic? Uh, yes and no. no. I, um, <laughs> yes, I, I practice Tai Chi more or less consistently for 22 years. For 22 uh, years? Yeah, Tai Chi and Qigong. However, in April or so, I decided to see what would happen if I just stopped. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what happened? See. I got an hour of my day back. 
because I, I mean, I, I also I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I like to, to, to stretch and lift weights and things. So I, my, my day was too full of stuff. And I thought, well, I, I prioritize what I'm learning, which is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and see what happens if I stop doing this. However, this is the problem. I find it so hard to quit. Like I, I can, you can quit martial arts or you can quit doing something. You could stop being a vegetarian or something. That's, but, but when I moved on from going to formal classes, like maybe 12 years ago or something, 10 years ago, I was easy for me to drop Kung Fu. I dropped Kung Fu because I was doing Charlie Foot Kung Fu and I dropped it. I just didn't, didn't think twice because I was doing something else that I thought was much more practical, mm -hmm. but I couldn't quit Tai Chi. And I, and I've struggled to put a, I can't give you reasons why I continue to do it or keep going back to it. I just kind of love it. Um, so I, although I've stopped, I will never stop. I'm currently not practicing, but that's only been for a few months. I, and actually, truth be told, a week or two ago, I, I did do a few days of, of practice just because uh, I missed it. <laughs> so, so yeah, yes and no. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, the audience are very are much interested in your talk. There are another a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, one of my colleagues said, thank you again for your brilliant talk, especially a really enlightening. What translation or transmission factors contribute to the feminization of Tai Chi in UK or in the West in general? Mm -hmm. Because within the country, I guess, we do not normally take Tai Chi, tai chi as very feminine. Yeah. I mean, I think to, to kind of get that argument, it's based on the, if you research Orientalism from, so Edward Said, who made the concept of Orientalism most well known in the West, he was really studying the kind of British and European and American representation of what we would today call the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but the concept of the East and East Asia has always been this land, uh, the way that it's been conceptualized historically for the last 500 years and more, more, more much older, um, has been one of a place of wonder, mystery, um, not um, it, it's it's not been so the West has regarded itself as kind of striding and striving and scientific and rational and strong and and all these masculine characteristics, whereas the, the East um, has been conceptualized therefore as not the West. It's been it's a place of mystery. It's a place of magic, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so concepts like chi are magical, uh, and also. So, I mean, I've written a lot about the way in which th this is set up as a basic semiotic contrast, and it's an overwhelmingly frequently recurring contrast in representations of the East. Um, and it's, it's also, I think, um, uh, helped by the fact that Tai Chi doesn't really easily fit into a Western uh, category. It's not really a sport. It's not a religion. It's not uh, simple calisthenics. It seems to appeal to different sets of concepts that don't quite fit into a Western spectrum of, of concepts. So therefore it's regarded as enigmatic. <laughs> and all of these terms that, you know, much discourse is associated with the feminine, strange, mysterious, uh, you know, <laughs> all of the rest of it, right? It's very kind of sexist sort of a, a setup. But um, it's so that these larger historical structures, ways of thinking about another culture uh, and the East has always been regarded as like somewhere mysterious and dark and, and dangerous and, and foreign and alien. Like the, 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 the word Asian, you know, the word Asia means essentially kind of alien, really. It's a Western, it's a European word that's been imposed, projected onto an entire uh, geographical region of the world and to simplify it. So it's feminized probably because it's not a sport. Is it a dance? No, it's not a dance. Is it, is it a ritual? It's kind of a ritual. Is it, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't make sense in Western, it does now, like now, you, there's so many, um, there's so much media and so much intensification, but it's almost like the West, uh, people, they still want that fantasy. They still want that fantasy of the mysterious 
orient with magic. People want, they want magic. They want chi. That's what they want. They want magic. They want boom, death force. They want to be Luke Skywalker or, or, or Yoda. I mean, Yoda in Star Wars is, is the oriental monk. So right. you have these, these scholars like Jane Uemura who writes about the history of the oriental monk in Western popular culture. So this is Miyagi, this is, uh, this is Yoda, this is the, in Kung Fu, you've got David Carradine's character, the oriental monk who's not masculine but is powerful. Um, and it, there's so many, all of these confluences of, of themes and tropes and images, the semiotic structure tends to make China um, it like other, obviously with a capital O, the other. Um, but that other is also, there it has to be different to the masculine, you know, the patriarchal structure of the West and therefore it, it's feminine. And it's also a way of justifying a, a view, worldview, which says they're weaker than us, but also a bit scary, right? Okay. Yeah, I see your point. Thank you. There is one last question um, from Dr. Ying Yan. Do people of Chinese origin carry more authority when it comes to the teaching of Tai Chi or Qigong than, say, uh, Hai Yo? Probably, yes. But I think that even more than that would be someone who could say, yeah, I, I studied in the Shaolin Temple, like a white person, a white Westerner who says, yeah, I studied in China for 10 years or something. That person would have even more authority <laughs> okay. um, because that is also a part of the structure of Orientalism, right? Because mm -hmm. the, 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 the white Westerner can go and, and learn how to be a samurai or a Shaolin monk. Um, so I think that, yes, People want to look for the, the, the little old Chinese man with a the beard. They want the white, they want Pai Mei, right? That's what they want. Um, but if you can't have Pai Mei, then you need a white Westerner who's been to, to studied in Shanghai or Beijing or, or Shaolin um, for, for any, any amount of time. That gives them authority. Not always, but that's the fantasy structure, I think. And I think that you could diagnose that. I think that it would be easy to find that, that bias. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for your enlightening um, talk. Thank you for. Thank you. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.